Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nestling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to become that confident leader and take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I am excited to have as my guest, Daryl Williams. And let me tell you about Daryl. So he brings executive extensive experience as a master certified life coach and a member of the Federal Coaching Network. He is an inspirational speaker and certified facilitator who provides clients with expertise in the realm of leadership, relationship, and purpose. His leadership background includes 30 years of federal service highlighted by his induction into the White House Communication Agency Hall of Fame. His leadership coaching is based on a stellar 20-year military career where he traveled as an operations and vice presidential communications officer, leading over 500 White House missions following the tragedies of September 11, 2001. Daryl was selected one of five key leaders from 30 senior managers to direct emergency action communication for the Vice President of the United States. To include duties as an Air Force officer, an Air Force to command representative. What a background, Mr. Williams. Our theme is going to be how to maximize your call. Please join me in welcoming my guest, Daryl Williams. I don't know. Should I stand? Should I salute? Should I just like go oh, blah blah? <laughs> None of the above. Yeah, you're just the guy that's talking it. to I'm, a girl about what he does. <laughs> that is really all it is, Vicky. <laughs> awesome. Well, I always ask the simple question: Where do you live? So I am talking to you from Glen Burnie, Maryland, oh. which is somewhere right between um, Annapolis and Baltimore. So my best friend, after she moved away from Youngwood, Pennsylvania, to Florida, and then Glen Burnie, Maryland, where she stayed until, through her college, got married in Annapolis in St. Mary's, and um, now lives in South Carolina, but been to Glen Burnie many times. Nice. Yeah, it's a very nice area. It is. Nice Nice place to call home. Very quiet. Yes. Well, we all need some quiet sometimes, right? (laughs) So how did you get from Compton, California, to the White House Communications Agency? It's a little jump there, Mr. Darrell Williams. Definitely a jump. Definitely a jump. And for me, uh, it really started um, just... um, my junior year, when you start, you know, everybody kind of takes stock of, okay, what's really going on in life and where do you want to go? And, you know, at the time growing up in Compton was the fourth most dangerous city in America. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, unfortunately though, that, you know, I may have saw the movie Boys in the Hood. That was kind of the environment that I grew up in. And my two brothers and sister grew up in the environment of straight out of Compton. So definitely uh, with some challenges uh, to say the least. And for me being the oldest, kind of put that on my shoulder like I need to make some really good decisions because it may affect them as well yeah. and what really helped me out was one weekend I just ran into a army recruiter I had no 
intent on joining the military. That wasn't even in my uh, on my scope. But then after just listening to him, I was like, you know what? This doesn't sound like a bad gig, right? Get to travel, uh, free education. I was like, let me try this thing. And it just really, really worked out um, for me. And I truly believed had I not joined the military, I would not have maximized my own purpose and call mm -hmm. to life because it allowed me to just learn so many things, um, learn some great principles that I still utilize today. Met some awesome leaders. I mean, men and women that, I mean, you would just, you know, really run mm -hmm. through a wall for because they yeah. were just so great. And just being in the military just opened up a lot of different doors um, for me throughout my career. So one of the things that I do is I work with the youth to help them improve their communication and leadership skills. And the way that I got involved in it was in Georgia here, way back in 2011, mm -hmm. the, a few schools were starting a program. I guess they started in 2010. And it was to bring ex-military in to teach leadership to Love the it. students that were at risk. Yes. And so these were kids that, you know, and not not from the toughest neighborhoods always. Oh, sure. um, they were from neighborhoods you would be surprised that there were things going on that they were going on, right? And so they had this program for one year, and then they, in 2011, found that uh, President Obama had cut the budget, and that was mm. one of the programs that they had to cut. Mm. And so at a Christmas party, as fate would have it, the teacher who was over the program said, can you help at all teaching kids leadership and communication? And so that's where I introduced the Toastmasters program to oh, these kids great. working with X. Um, so right now, the person that I'm still working with after all these years is Master Sergeant Major Seprin Mumfield whose son plays for Pitt. He's awesome. Amazing. <laughs> Shout out to Master Sage at Martin, Sergeant Mumfield. But the thing, the reason that it impresses me is this is something that the kids at middle school age and high school age don't realize how vital good communication is and how one wrong step can change your trajectory and your life, good or bad good or bad. And, um, and I just love that you have that story to say that you came from a really tough way that could have come out a really bad way. And look at you today. I mean, listen to you today. I just love, love, love that your story. So you got in the military. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you it wasn't always a bed of roses that first year coming from the country. <laughs> what lessons did you learn from being in the military? So you're right. It definitely wasn't easy, but it was the best thing for me. And even with all the craziness, I would do it all over again. I wouldn't change anything. Um, one of the best parts of the military, especially the very beginning, um, going to boot camp, and this is old school boot camp. So we're all in the barracks and, you know, you have all these men from different parts of the United States. And I just love, to this day, Vicky, I remember our conversation that night where it was like, hey, uh, people just kind of going out of turn and taking turns, basically like, hey, is this the first time um, you've been under the same roof? um with a minority or this first time you've been with somebody from the country I mean we just had so many honest conversations mm -hmm. Vicky and people were debunking a lot of myths and things of that nature and it was just one of the best conversations I ever had in my life mm -hmm. because it allowed all of us to get to know each other mm -hmm. uh on a real more personal level so by the time we started going through the different training and uh, all the different courses we had to go, it was like, I'm not going to let Vicky fail, yeah. right? I know Vicky. I know 
why she joined the military. She didn't want to work in a factory and she wanted to create this new paradigm for her. So it's like, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that she makes it. And everybody just had that same mindset. And even the ones that maybe they were an athlete and they joined thinking that they had all the answers and they can do all the physical exercises. One thing I loved about the military is I don't care who you are, it breaks you down as an individual, but then it builds you back up as a team. And when you have that mindset that I don't care how strong, how fast, how smart you are, if you can't do these tasks with your battle buddy, which is the person that they have aligned you up with, you will fail basic training and we will send you home. And, you know, it's a culture shock for people that are individuals mm-hmm. and not realizing that, you know, this isn't about individuals, it's about a yeah. team, it's about selfless service. And like you said, being able to take those type of skills, and I used to be a former youth pastor, so to be able to take all of that and bring it to the community, it's just amazing the things that mm-hmm. we take for granted, where somebody else thinks that that is gold that you're teaching them. Yeah. It is so, so very true. Um, and and I think that that's one of the things when I teach about leadership is leading with the heart, the head, and the hands. The, the reason I always start with leading with the heart is you have to know your people. And that means you have to be willing to open up about your pain, about your failures, about your uh, vulnerability, so that they will know it's safe to talk about theirs. And that's where those beautiful conversations like you had in that that uh, bunkhouse mm-hmm. came about. So awesome. So how did faith help you in your career? So well, that's a good one. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times people kind of run away from those types of topics. And I understand why, because you have some people that are excited about their new change and they want to change the world as well. But I've realized with the wisdom that, you know, those there are some things you just need to live in front of people instead Mm -hmm. of beating them over the head with it. Yeah. And that helped me out a lot. And I was telling somebody on a podcast last week that I found for me overall, my faith was higher than my ethics. Mm. Well, the, whatever the ethics were that the military was trying to teach me, it's like, oh, no, I'm already beyond that yeah. because I have to turn the other cheek. I have to do these other principles that you're trying to get other people to learn. And that's already a part of who I am. Yeah. So I honestly believe, Vicki, that that made me a very strong leader because I was already getting the mentoring from those that had experience over me. But then the faith part allowed me to kind of form it into my own leadership style. And it was a difference when I was in the military because I was at that crossroads where you had a lot of older leaders, like you said, they were not Mm -hmm. transparent and they did not subscribe to the soft skills that were being introduced from industry, (laughs) right? Into the military. They were like, oh no, that stuff won't work here. And Mm-hmm. People are not going to listen. You have to be able to just tell them what to do. And and it really helped me because I was a part of that leadership generation that I was not threatened because a lot of the kids at that time that were coming in the military, I mean, they were smarter. I mean, just have mm-hmm. to be honest, right? So it wasn't just go take the wall, but why are we taking that wall? Yeah. And to be able to say, you know what, that is a fantastic question. Let me explain something to you. Let me give you a little background, Mm -hmm. a little history. And then to be able to pivot on that same question and go, so now that we know that we need to take this wall, what do you think are some things that we should consider as we take this wall? Because maybe the way I took it last year, it can be taken a better way. So just being able to draw them into the strategy and allowing them to have that ownership. It was just an amazing thing for me. And again, all of that really just came with my faith, which is, I don't know all the answers, but I know collectively, if I give people a voice, um, we can all solve it better. I think to the, the piece of faith can be related to the inevitable imposter syndrome that you're going to have. Because well, we do 
encourage mentors and coaches and people, uh, confidants, if you will. But sometimes you're in that room all by yourself. And the only person that you can talk to to help you get through this is God. Whatever your God is. But, you know, sometimes that's that will get you through it, right? It is. And the thing that I could say that helped me was I never presented it to people. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of people to this day, they didn't even know I was a minister or yeah. toward the end, you know, associate pastor. And I always love their comment. They're like, why didn't you tell me that? I wouldn't have been cursing in front of you like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I would tell them, Vicki, it doesn't matter um, because you are your authentic self. And yeah. anytime I'm around people, I want you to be your authentic self. I don't want anybody yeah. walking on eggshells or thinking, oh, I can't talk about this particular movie around him. You know, to me, sometimes those type of things um, can get in the way of pure relationships. Yeah. yeah. And to this day, um, I love it. And it was the same concept, even growing up in Compton. I mean, I had friends that were, you know, really good into the books, but I had friends that were gangbangers. Yeah. And people were like, why are you hanging around those people? I'm like, well, they're leaders too. Unfortunately, they're using their leadership style in a, you know, a way that's not, you know, the best, but they're still people. And if we recluse ourselves from them, how are they going to learn that there's a different yeah. path? Yeah. Exactly right. I mean, to me, we are all tasked to, to lead the right way, right? And people are watching us all the time. And so mm -hmm. if, your authentic self comes out and it is doing the right thing. People are watching you do the right thing and you hope you pray that they will follow that lead, but you have to give them a reason why. And that's where your heart, you know, you're, you're showing that you care will make them want to watch you, want to listen to you. So I think that's important. I, I think as you were talking about that, uh, and this is not one of the, the questions, but this it's is okay. how I love, this is why I love the way I do my podcast is you work for the government, my dear sir. <laughs> mm -hmm. Authentic sometimes is not what we find in the government. How, as a communication person, did you guide them to be, uh, give them permission to be their authentic self whenever they felt that they needed to put on a different mask? No, that's a great question. So especially working for the wireless communications agency during that time, you know, out of those 15 years, you know, we worked for a lot of different administrations, right? Yeah. And people kind of see the glamorous part of that job, but they don't see the backside of the job, which is yeah. people are coming in with different ideas, um, different uh, ways that they want to do things and not realizing, you know, there's certain standards, equipment has certain capabilities and for a lot of the team members um, there were some people that were you know kind of disgruntled as far as why are they not listening why are they mm -hmm. not paying attention so the biggest thing I could do for them at that time was one give them a time to vent because I don't care who you are you have to let things out and then once I let them vent then we just went into uh, training mode. It's like, you no, know, why do you think, you know, they believe that they can get anything they want? You know, mm -hmm. why do they believe that equipment should do more? And then once we start talking through those things, it's like, okay, so now that we know that, what can we do when we go back to them instead of with a snarky attitude, right? But how can we really help them get to whatever the goal is? Because if they're asking for those things, that means that there is a particular goal that they have to accomplish. So, Again, our job is not to really question them or get into the politics of it all, but you know, how do we allow them to maximize the communication support that we provide so that we can all get to a win? And yeah. I, I think those are the things that help me with them because a lot of them would come to me after the fact and say things like, thanks for allowing me to vent. Thanks for allowing me to see it from a different perspective. Always looked at it from, you know, they just don't like us or Mm -hmm. things of that nature and sometimes that's not the case but you have to allow people to talk through those things versus like you know, some leaders um they try to get on that pity bandwagon and mm -hmm. make everybody yeah i know what you mean they're this they're that but that's not right the right type of leadership because they're mm -hmm. going to eventually go to a leader that doesn't do that 
and they're going to go, well, why isn't Vicky agreeing with me? That's what my other leaders did. And now Vicky is that different leader that says, no, you got to rise above that type of mindset. Yeah, yeah. That's for all the younger people out in the audience um, to hear that because sometimes we do try to not rock the boat and just go along and not be our individual self. And that's what God gave you that mind for. So, <laughs> okay. What is the greatest challenge you've had in leadership thus far? <laughs> so a lot of different things, but one of the biggest challenges is leading team members during a presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. Again, on TV, all you see is the candidates or even the current president who we always supported and provided support to. You just see them showing up you know, from Georgia to Florida to mm -hmm. all the different states and then different cities within that state. But, you know, there is a group of people, you know, military members behind the scenes that are making all those things happen. And normally for those stateside trips, you normally get there at that time, you know, a week before, yeah. right, to set up all the equipment, make sure things are tested, work out all the bugs and the kinks. And then you have to realize that even in the midst of this historical moment of presidential campaigning, life is still going on, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have people on the road, you know, their spouse is pregnant. They were supposed to do maybe one or two trips mm -hmm. and then go back to D.C. And during a campaign, we have what we call jumps. So you may jump from Atlanta and mm -hmm. go to Augusta, right, and go to another part of Georgia and you may do five or six jumps before you go back to D.C. So one of the bigger challenges for me is how do you get people, one, to stay motivated, keep yeah. the morale high, right, and still accomplish that mission. And I remember one of the swings, uh, one of the leads came to me and said, hey, we have this person on this trip. They've been making mistakes over the last three jumps. So I'm telling you in advance, they're probably going to make a mistake here. So if you want to write them up, I understand. And I'm like, well, you're the lead. Why would I write them up? I'm like, yeah, but you're over the whole trip. Mm. I said, well, you know what? Let's just see how things play out. Maybe it'll be different. And sure enough, Vicky, the person, you know, made some mistakes. And they were so used to being chewed out when they came to my office on the road. They were like, you know, go ahead and give it to me. And I'm like, oh. and I'm like no, um, that's not how this conversation is going to go. I need to find out, is there anything going on in your life or something that's yeah. changed since you started the campaign? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those are so busy times that sometimes you just don't have time to do that. You revert back to those old military ways of just do it, just do it. Yeah. You know? And I wanted to make sure I understood what was going on. And you know, he, he opened up mm -hmm. and said that my wife is pregnant. I was supposed to have been home um two weeks ago mm. and now she's mad at me because i'm not at home so i'm feeling that pressure but then i'm also making mistakes because i don't want to let my team down yeah so i feel like i'm trapped because if i leave i'm not doing my share and then if i you know don't go my wife is wondering you know why are you putting this ahead of our children and it was really difficult and i just told him that i appreciate him being honest I understood what he was coming from. Luckily, I knew his leader back in the rear in D.C., so I told him that um, after this trip, you are going back to the rear. And he was like, no, I don't want to seem like I'm soft. I don't want to seem like I'm not oh, doing my yeah. share. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, 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 no. I said, we're still in the beginning of the campaign. I said, we have many months left. And the best thing that you can do for us is be at your best which is taking care of your family, being there for that, yeah. you know, little one that's about to be born and being there for your wife. Cause I'm sure you have a um, system that's already set up and she has a family network there. However, it's nothing like you being there, giving her that comfort. So that's what we're going to do. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to mention the mistakes because to me that's irrelevant because we know why they were happening. Yeah. What I want to do is, and I told him, I'm going to call your first sergeant and let them know that, you know, he wanted to stay. He wanted to support his uh, brothers and sisters on the road. He wanted to do his part. But I made the decision that I just thought it would be good for him to take a little break. 
take care of some personal things and then we'll get him back on the back end. And to me, even though those are a challenging time, but it's the best times because you start thinking about what did that young man learn yeah. during yeah. A, a crazy time and then how would that affect him moving forward? Yeah, and if he gets you know, to that position or when he gets to that position, when he has people that he has to make that decision, how will he do it? I mean, the, that moment he will always remember in a positive light, I guarantee you. And that's the kind of leaders we need. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one thing I always told people, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be able to do this forever. So I have to, you know, replicate myself and all the good things. I said, <laughs> but you're going to bring your own style to the table and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Absolutely. So when we talk about any job, you know, whether it be your communications teams and, or, but how can, what is one thing that you would suggest to help people achieve their goals? Two things that come to mind um, definitely are first, finding a mentor. Yeah. I don't care what industry you're in, there is somebody there that has already walked that path, probably still walking that path, mm -hmm. and amazingly want to help you walk mm -hmm. that path a little bit easier than what they did. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we just have to pause. We're so busy in life sometimes that we never pause just to say, wait a minute, let me just think about who's in my inner circle, who's close mm -hmm. to me that I can trust and they can trust me. And I always used to tell a lot of young people, you'd be surprised that person that you hate at school is probably the best teacher you ever had because they see something in you that you don't see in yourself. So guess what? They're going to ride you harder because mm -hmm. that's how they're going to bring it out of you. And so it is with life. You know, we have to look at those mentors and those people that are willing to pour into us. And sometimes we kind of go with these preconceived notions like, oh, Vicky doesn't want to pour into me. I'm too young. She's already established and working on her new podcast. She doesn't have time for me. And I always have to tell people, stop saying no for other people. Yeah. <laughs> Let them tell you no. And if they do, it just means that they have some things going on and they're not in a position to be your mentor yet, or there's somebody else that you should mm. reach out to. But definitely getting a mentor just solves so many different challenges. And then the second thing I always tell people is an accountability partner, mm -hmm. not a best friend. They yeah. can be a best friend, but they have to be that person that's going to tell you like it is, mm -hmm. the person that's going to hold you to what you said your goal was. You said, okay, I want to start a podcast after... Uh, COVID and it's like, okay, what are you doing for research? What type of equipment have you found that you need? Mm -hmm. Are you going to um, put it on a particular platform? What platform? An accountability partner helps you move the needle in life. Uh, and tells you when you suck and but then, you know, not just that, but, you know, well, why? <laughs> you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's not like you, because I told you so, you know, our old, my momism, but, yes. <laughs> you know, no, okay, let me just have that discussion. I think one of the, the best moments in my life were listening to my mom, uh, my daughter, who is a mom of two boys. Oh, now, nice. At four and, and eight, and listening to her talk to them and not giving them the, because I said so. There you go. Actually explaining why. And I thought, okay, thank you, Jesus. Yes. She listened and she learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so good. So how did you overcome adversity? And and this is something, again, that isn't just in communications. Mm. It just, it, it's an entrepreneur. It's everything we do, but understanding how important communication is to that, I think is really the key note here. No, you're exactly right. And the way that I overcame adversity uh, really was surrounding myself with 
again, people that I knew cared about me and not what I could do for them or how many White House tours I can get them on, but people that cared about me, the person and not me, the profession. And that really came to play uh, when my wife and I, we had uh, two miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing before how it seems like when those type of things happen, um, a lot of people just normally gravitate to the wife, which is totally understandable. But for the men, every now and then, we're just so we'll fix ourselves that we kind of struggle going through those type of things on our own. And for me, that was a very uh, difficult time to go through because one, you're a leader, right? You're a leader in, on the job. You're a leader in the church. You're a leader in the community. So it's like, how do you get through this? And oh, by the way, you have to lead your wife through this. Yeah. while also leading yourself. So that was definitely one of the biggest um, adversities I had to deal with. And the way I dealt with it, um, obviously my faith helped me out a lot. Mm -hmm. But also being able to talk to people. I always try to share this point for men. It's like, I know we're tough and we're built to solve problems, but we weren't built to solve problems alone. Yeah. So it's okay to find those individuals that you trust, those individuals that care about you, the person. And you're not weak when you go to them and say, hey, here's what I'm feeling, right? Is yeah. it wrong for me to be feeling this way? Should I, is that selfish? Should I just be there for my wife only and I'll take care of myself some other time? And I think it's good for men to be able to talk those things out yeah. because the truth of the matter is you're going to get through it. But as my wife says, you know, sometimes you're in your storm as long as you allow yourself to be in yeah. it. So when you, when you do it by yourself, there's a tendency to allow that healing process to go longer than what it yeah, should. Yeah, wallow in it. Having um, two miscarriages myself, mm -hmm. I, it always surprised me how surprised people were that I talked about it. Yes. And I talked about it because I knew how I felt and I didn't want other people to have to go through that without knowing that they could talk to other people that there were other people and, and that the feelings that they were having were okay. You know? So important. So important because so many people, not purposely, but they just say so many things that don't make sense mm -hmm. that you need people like yourself to be able to, you know, be the person that makes sense. Like I remember one guy at my job, he didn't mean it. But I just remember him saying, well, maybe you did something wrong in your life. And, mm. you know, this is kind of something that you have to go through to right that wrong. And I was like, you know, that is an interesting thought. I respect that thought. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how time will tell. Mm. Right. But just to say something like that. Oh, my God. That was like a, a, a more inexperienced person. I would have been devastating or yeah. it could have hurt the friendship. And the person didn't realize what they were saying because in their mind, they thought, oh, maybe this is a reason. And yeah. no, there are no reasons for things like that. Yeah. So it, it, time has gone by. So um, <laughs> let's see, I can do one sure. rapid fire. What were some challenges flying aboard Air Force Two? Definitely the biggest challenges is when equipment does not work. <laughs> 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 there is nothing in this world to this day that makes you cringe than hearing the vice president of the United States say or ask, is there a problem? <laughs> <laughs> he knows there's a problem. I know he knows there's a problem. <laughs> so as we kind of maneuver this dance, how do we work through this? And uh, again, fix the, the problem. <laughs> exactly, right? So the honest answer is, yes, Mr. Vice President, there is a problem, but with every problem, there's a possible solution, and we're working on that solution right now. Mm. And then you have a military aide that's like, is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? It's like, sir, mm. give us some time, right? We've got to work through this thing. But that is always one of the biggest challenges is because you're not mm. on the ground with all this extra equipment, and you got yeah. other team members that can – it's just you, that audiovisual tech, and um, the equipment that you can carry on that plane. And that yeah. was always one of those things you get on there, you kind of like cross your finger, like, please, let mm -hmm. just be the one where nothing happens. <laughs> <I know. laughs> oh, 
Well, it's time now for me to share my screen. So if you're just listening in and you haven't been taking some notes, go ahead and grab that paper and pencil so you can get the website information and be able to connect with Daryl. So his website is https colon forward slash forward slash www.allianceseminars.org. Again, allianceseminars.org. On Facebook, you can find him at Alliance Seminars and LinkedIn, you can find him by his name, Daryl Williams. Daryl has two R's and two L's, so make sure you get that right, Daryl Williams. I'm going to let Daryl talk to you. What can you find on that website as well as the social media? Sure. Um, just a lot of the things that I've learned over the my time in the military and 15 years at the White House. Um, I just always tell people I did not have the type of life that I had just to walk around and boast about it. I have to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. So really the website is just... You know, some of the services that um, I provide, as well as my wife, right? I have her, mm -hmm. she works with a lot of women, and we kind of a tag team on this thing. And again, it's just one of those things of paying it forward, trying to be there, whether it's through coaching or facilitation or keynote speaking, just trying to help people and organizations, you know, maximize, you know, their potential. Awesome. Well, it's just been really wonderful chatting with you. Great stories, I'm sure. We could spend another hour talking about some more stories and things, but I, I just really think that it's important, especially, you know, because I do work with the youth and, and there's, uh, as I'm with the kids, um, middle school and high schoolers, sometimes, you know, they, they are not thinking about what one action can do. You know, they think that they're bulletproof oftentimes and, and, and just one thing can change your whole trajectory, as we said, to the good or to the bad, right? And being able to communicate well, so to communicate so that people actually hear you and to listen well, to be understood are just two things that you cannot, cannot stop learning. Very true. Well, as always, I thank you for being my guest and reminding everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nettling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.